Hello and welcome to the Data Science Innovation Driving Alzheimer's Disease Insights. I'm Gina Constantikopoulos, the Senior Director of Partner Engagement here at Matter. And Matter is a healthcare technology incubator and innovation hub built on the belief that collaboration between entrepreneurs and industry leaders is the best way to develop healthcare solutions. Our mission is to accelerate the pace of change of healthcare, and we do three things in service of this mission. First, we incubate startups. Since we launched eight years ago, we've worked with more than 800 companies that range from very early growth stage startups to larger companies, and we offer them a suite of services to help at every stage of their development. Our member companies have raised more than $5 billion to fuel their growth. Second, we work with larger organizations such as health systems, life science companies, payers, foundations to strengthen their innovation capacity. And we help them find value in emerging technology solutions by unlocking full potential of both their internal innovators and then creating more human-centered healthcare experiences through system level collaboration. And third, we're a nexus for people who are passionate about healthcare innovation. We bring people together to be inspired, to learn, and to connect with each other. We produce a lot of programs like this one today, including large-scale events for the broader community and small forums exclusively for our members and partners. Today's event is being conducted alongside our Brain Health Innovation Challenge, which you'll hear a little bit more about at the end of this program, that we're producing with support from <clears throat> the Lundbeck U.S. Charitable Fund. Uh, it is an independently managed nonprofit 501c3 that is committed to the responsibility and appropriate support of programs about restoring brain health. The Lundbeck U.S. Charitable Fund is wholly owned by Lundbeck, a global pharmaceutical company specializing in brain disease, but for more than 70 years, Lundbeck has been at the forefront of neuroscience research tirelessly dedicated to restoring brain health so that every person can be their best. So for today, for years, data analytics has been used in healthcare to fuel faster, accurate diagnoses, to inform decision-making, personalized treatment, improve patient care and outcomes, lower costs, and more. But with the re uh, recent advances that we're seeing with big data and uh, generative artificial intelligence, more organizations are exploring how these new ways uh, can take modern day data science tools to address persistent healthcare challenges. So talking about challenges, one of the key challenges right now in advancing care for our growing population of older people is living with Alzheimer's disease and the related dementias. And we're saying that there are a wide range of disparate sources of raw data, including electronic health records, personal health records, patient portals, health-related smartphones, uh, wearables, and lots of unstructured data out there. And the question is, how can we gain meaningful insights? Well, hopefully our panel today will help us to dig into that. Today, we're joined by Mary Furlong, a leader in the longevity market, Elizabeth Powers, the Vice President and General Manager of U.S. Regulatory Science and Study Innovation in IQVIA, and Ryan Urbanowitz, Research Scientist, Computational Biomedicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center, and the co-lead of Tech ID and Training Corps at PIN AI Tech in the A2 Collective. Um, and our conversation today is going to just dig into this topic. So with that, hello, everyone. Hey, how's it going? Hi, Ryan. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Hi Mary. Gina. <laughs> Great to have you guys join us today. Um, before we really kind of dig into the topic at hand, I'm going to go around the table and have you tell me a little bit more about yourselves and how you've come to look both at uh, the growing older population in the U.S., uh, brain health as it relates to Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and then this question of data. All right, so I'm going to start with you, Mary, if you can tell me a little bit about kind of you and your role. Well, I've been at this a long time. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I have started three companies, and I think um, have raised about uh, $250 million in corporate sponsorships and venture financing for startups that are building companies in the longevity market. I produce the Longevity Venture Summit, um, which I've done for about 20 years. 
and the Washington Innovation Summit, and I have a podcast called Longevity Deal Talk. In terms of brain science, I'm an advisor to the Canadian Brain Health CABI group. I've been part of Posit Science since the beginning, and I'm recently judging the UK competition for uh, business plans related to research and dementia. Thank you. I'm sure your uh, wide array of uh, experience here will be of great use today in our conversation. Elizabeth, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yes. So um, as you said, I'm vice president and general manager of a group within IQVIA called Regulatory Science and Study Innovation. Our primary mission is to find ways of unlocking access to clinically rich data uh, including new data sources, you know, some traditional data sources like electronic medical records, but also new data sources like wearables and so forth, um, big data sources, small data sources, um, and really figuring out how to use those data sources in a way that has scientific credibility and, and rigor. Um, and so we are in the early stages of um, building out some new research networks that focus on CNS, including Alzheimer's. Um, and obviously, you know, there are a lot of exciting treatments um, coming to market for Alzheimer's and dementia. And with that comes um, a bolus of research uh, sponsored by pharma companies. And we are heavily involved in, in various efforts around that. So really happy to be here with you today. Thank you. We're excited to have you and certainly um, have someone who's riding the wave, so to speak, uh, of what's happening out there in the ecosystem. Um, last but certainly not least, Ryan, we have you. And I think that you are our resident data guru. So if you would uh, please share a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Sure. I'm, I'm Ryan Urbanowitz. Um, I'm currently an assistant professor at Cedar Sinai Medical Center, as well as an adjunct at UPenn. Um, I run the Herbs Lab. Uh, we do research in the development of machine learning and artificial intelligence methods, as well as our application to a variety of biomedical uh, target data points or uh, objectives. Um, and our lab specializes in the development of automated machine learning tools, uh, as well as er interpretable rule-based machine learning. So I'm very much coming at this from the, the computer science side, data analytics side. Uh, and I've gotten involved in Alzheimer's research in particular over the last couple of years through the Penn AI Tech and A2 uh, Collaborative that's funding uh, uh, research grants for technologies and AI, especially uh, applied to Alzheimer's and dementia uh, and, and other aging issues. Um, and I approach data kind of agnostically uh, because I'm involved in a lot of domains uh, and also because many of the challenges uh, and questions in data science are, are kind of universal and generalizable. Um, and, uh, but, you know, there, there's a lot of things that I think about in terms of Alzheimer's in, in, that are unique in terms of, you know, data quality, um, what features to collect, things like that. So anyway, yep. Well, great. I think we have the perfect set of perspectives uh, to get our conversation uh, underway here. So let, let's kind of pivot here, which is I'm going to start with you, Elizabeth, um, which is Alzheimer's disease and related dementias are on the rise, as we know. Our older population is growing, and because Alzheimer's disease and dementia tend to have a later onset for most people, uh, it kind of goes in hand. Um, with the prevalence of these cognitive disorders increasing, it means that we're looking at more people encountering these diseases. And what are you hearing about some of the challenges in the marketplace as it relates to this? So I think um, I'll start, I'll kind of organize this along the, the patient journey, if you will. Um, you know, I think, first of all, there is patient and caregiver fear and uncertainty um, about, you know, what is happening with what is happening to me, what is happening to my, to my parent, my aunt, my grandparent, uh, my brother, my sister. And, and and deep fear about knowing an answer because of the implications of that from, from a caregiver perspective. Then um, what, once someone is within, a, you know, seeing a clinician about this, you know, we're not, so in my, I, I was just sitting here thinking, I've been working in Alzheimer's for 
almost 20 years now. And, you know, I think we're still seeing very inconsistent practices. It's not like, frankly, oncology, where, you know, there are cl relatively clear lines of care. Um, it's, it, it's, there's not even clear diagnoses. Um, and that is still the case. Now, you know, my own personal hope is that over the next five to 10 years with new therapies coming, it will overcome both physician, patient, and caregiver resistance to a diagnosis. Um, because there are treatments. Oftentimes when you're in, in therapies where there aren't really meaningful treatments, it, it can be very difficult uh, to, to get to a diagnosis. Um, and then there's just you know record keeping. Actually, what gets put into the EMRs it is very different from physician to physician. Um, and then there's, uh, the last thing I'll say is then there's the the burden on the caregiver, whether that is someone in a, a nursing facility, step step down, step up care facility, um, assisted living facility, or just in a home um, with family, um, you know, there has to be a limit on the burden that's put on, on the caregiver. And that's something that really has to be taken into strong consideration both in terms of treatment and care and in terms of data collection for research. So I'll just hit pause there. Um, I think there's that's uh, rich ground for us, I think, to play in. But Mary, I'm going to pivot to you next because I know that longevity is something that you think a lot about and kind of this growing population of, of concern around brain health, not just, by the way, um, you know, do I have ulterior disease or dementia, but preventively, what can I be thinking about to do that? And kind of uh, having a community of peers kind of focused as well. What's kind of your take on what's happening in the marketplace? I thought I might size the market. So the longevity mm -hmm. market's an $8.3 trillion market. And then there's a lot of riches in the niches. So um, if you look at um, the boomers, they are at the top end 77. So in three years, they're going to be 80. And then you've got 20 years of boomer, right? You know, 20 years of older adults coming behind them. Um, so it's a huge market. Now, the opportunity for innovation in the home, in the care setting, in the adult day setting, in senior housing communities, and in places with dementia wings. That's really important to look at, but we're just at the very beginning. I mean, more people watch Wheel of Fortune than um, that's their cognitive fitness. And so if you take an issue like driving, which I'm very concerned about right now, because you look at the number of people who are not going to be able to drive in the next 10 years, and we're not prepared for that in terms of accessing resources in the home. So some of the analysts think, Uber Health is one of the most important new brands or brands out there that can be play a role, but lighting can play a role. Pharma can play a role. Um, and there's a huge staff shortage. So there's really got to be brand new models for how we uh, find, train, and uh, retain caregivers. Um, it is certainly... <laughs> no, there's not. I, mean, I think that that's maybe maybe that's part of this, right? Which is that there's so much, not just from a standpoint of talking about the number of people that are potentially impacted by this, but the myriad uh, of kind of concerns that they're starting to have to consider, right? Not just um, uh, healthcare and data, but kind of these larger um, access issues that you pointed to that all have a role to play in things like diagnosis or care. So really interesting. I think I want to take some of these things and maybe Ryan, I'll come to you next, which is kind of this notion of data. We heard from Elizabeth, you know, about data and uh, relating to this kind of group being in lots of different places. Um, as someone who spends their days looking at these troves of data, what do you think the current state of 
um, certainly Alzheimer's data, but maybe brought more broadly this, you know, older adult and population level data that could start to have a play into things. What does that look like to you? Uh, I think like a lot of uh, biomedical domains, you know, the data is distributed, it's siloed, it's messy. Um, you know, we're still figuring out in many cases, what are the right variables? What is the right information to collect on patients, right? Like, what do we need to be collecting in order to target care or, you know, to monitor for care? Um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions in terms of just knowing, you know, what to gather correctly let alone how to do it well. Um, and thinking ahead is really important. I think that's already been brought up. Uh, you know, we need to think about what the future needs are gonna be and make our data collection systems adaptable so that as our understanding of these issues changes, so can be the way that we collect our data and the way we utilize our data to translate it back into patient care or, or help or whatever it is uh, that we wanna focus on. And maybe, you know, uh, as a way to take another kind of step back here, when you're looking, uh, you know, day, day, day to day at these data sets, are, are you only thinking about things like the, the older adult and Alzheimer's disease? Or are you looking um, at other kind of patterns and approaches that you're taking elsewhere? Yeah, no, I, I, I wish I could say I'm entirely focused on Alzheimer's disease. But no, I, I, I think very broadly about a lot of biomedical outcomes and work with a number of data types. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one small example, um, I was involved in a clinical trial uh, 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 for, um, uh, atri um, oh, no, I'm forgetting, <laughs> I'm getting my biomedical outcomes mixed up. But anyway, in this, in this project, they had clinical trial data from multiple sites and just harmonizing the data from these pretty well-structured uh, programs was an absolute nightmare. It took, you know, two, three years just to bring this data together before we can even really analyze it. And, mm -hmm. and just this as a reflection of what, you know, the current state tends to be in the medical field in terms of, you know, uh, being on the same page right from the get-go and how we're going to collect information or how do we make use of the data that's already out there? How do we bring it together and leverage it in a way that is reliable and trustworthy? Mm-hmm. And Ryan, if I can just dovetail on that, I mean, you just said that you were involved in a clinical trial and there was an enormous amount of effort to, to harmonize the data across sites. That's under the best of circumstances where sites are entering things into a pre-designed ECRF to be you know, case report form to feed into an electronic data capture system. When you're working with real world data where every epic, even if the EMR is epic, every system is configured differently, much less than adding in data from that's, that is occurring from outside the actual side of care, um, but getting a sense of, you know, what, what's, what is a, a person's activity level? Um, what's happening with certain biometric you know, bio, uh, you know, biometric data, heart rate, sweat, anxiety. Um, these are all things that are relevant to, to patients, people, people with dementia. And um, that data gets very hard to integrate and is incredibly messy. Absolutely. Uh, and one other quick sort of side note, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, when we're thinking about collecting new data, Another big point that might be worth discussing more is, is thinking about patient privacy concerns, right? Like we, we want to, you know, be collecting this data and, and so that we can make best use of it, but also how do we do that without, you know, patients feeling like they're being monitored or giving away their personal freedoms? There's actually a question in the chat um, about passive data collection. Um, you know, I think, so we're just beginning, so in, in, in IQV's business, we're really just beginning to see large scale studies come through, real world studies come through where, where sponsors are hoping to have passive data collection, you know, through a wearable, I mean, that's among what it really has to be in a certain way. Um, but, um, you know, actually having a validated tool for that, it, it's, I, 
in my experience, it's still very much early days. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's, it is, in our view, it is critical for research in dementia and Alzheimer's to have this for a whole range of reasons tied to things I've already said. But, um, but I think we're still some, some years to at, at least two to three, if not five to 10, from really having the sophistication of tools and sensors to be able to do this easily and without burdening the patient or the caregiver. You know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I think we do this in healthcare a lot, Elizabeth, which is when we, when the first questions I, I asked you, you started with patient experience and caregiver experience, which is like that individual level of healthcare, which is so intimate and so personable, but at the same point to make that a really meaningful kind of uh, evidence-based uh, experience for them, we depend on population level data, right? We depend on the roll-up of all of that to enable that personal experience. So um, maybe, you know, Ryan, a question for you, as we talk about these disparate realms of data, um, development, production, uh, living, you know, little living spots, how do you think about population level data and unlocking some of those insights? You know, where it, either for this older population, or we, are you thinking that we need to look? Um, and you know, what's your experience as someone who um, is looking at things like AI to uncover some of those things? So there, there's already uh, an incredible wealth of tools out there uh, for machine learning and AI. You know, uh, some great advancements. Obviously, that's still an evolving field as well. There's a billion unanswered questions. But you know, in terms of thinking about analyzing this kind of data, the first thing that I worry about that sometimes can get overlooked, I think, is you know the the data quality and collection, right? Like, and that is absolutely essential. You, know, you might have heard the the phrase "garbage in, garbage out," right? Like, it's it's tempting to have this magical thinking about machine learning and AI. It's like I'll just pass it to the tools, and and then I'll get something good. And, and, you know, the, the real meat of all of this is always going to be what variables do I collect? What is the quality of the data I'm collecting so that I can leverage these, you know, awesome new tools to really make the boat most out of the data, but at the same time, you know, not fall into, you know, uh, pitfalls like bias, right? Bias is a huge one, making sure our predictive algorithms are fair, right? They're, they're, that they're, uh, uh, they allow fairness in their decision-making capabilities, as well as the information we glean from these tools and models. Uh, one, you know, in terms of methodologies and making use of the data, I mentioned earlier, one of the areas of research I'm in is automated machine learning. Um, and I'm actually just writing on a paper on it right now and surveyed a, a large number of AutoML tools, which is making it, you know, a lot easier for people to use machine learning and, and hopefully do a better job uh, then, you know, uh, uh, the, the problem with machine learning analysis pipelines is that there's a billion ways to make one, right? Everyone has an opinion, everyone has, you know, belief, and there's a lot of right ways to do it, but there's also a lot of wrong ways to do it. So uh, paying attention to the evolving machine learning AI field in terms of how data analysis is conducted, I think is important. We're all taking a role in being critical of you know, how how we do that, uh, I think is going to be really valuable in the future. Well, maybe kind of taking um, uh, a page from that, you know, this notion of garbage in, garbage out, you know, there are a lot of efforts currently underway, uh, such as the National Institute on Aging is creating some data repositories. Um, there are a number of other organizations that are looking to kind of create these data pools of, um, of information that has been well collected so that people who are looking to train their solutions, train their AI, have, you know, data that um, is uh, relevant and meaningful. Um, I'd love to hear maybe Elizabeth and Mary, if you know about some of these kinds of efforts underway, what your thoughts are as far as these data collection and repository efforts that are happening. Well, I, I know it from the NIA funding. So there's $160 million, I think, every year that they are funding. And I think about 60% of that is going into 
innovations related to um, brain health. And so we can look to the work of some of those entrepreneurs and see what they see. But um, maybe I should turn it to Elizabeth to say more. Um, so there are some data sets that are, are large enough, um, but with the evolution of treatment, um, I think what we're seeing is that those data set, what, what needs to be in those data sets is, is evolving. And so they don't always fit the bill, depending on what you're wanting to research. Um, and um, I do, I do want to address a couple of points, you know, Ryan made a point earlier, and there are a couple of things in the going on in the, the Q&A chat here about, um, I'll, I'll call it broadly, social determinants of health. Part of what we're seeing with the coming surge of Alzheimer's, the, the existing and, and kind of tidal wave as, of Alzheimer's research that we're seeing is, um, is the need for more diverse data. And what that means is that you can't just go, so, so typically mm -hmm. large pools of data have been driven through academic research centers. Those research centers skew wealthier, wider. I don't, I'm sorry to make mass generalizations, but this is what we see again and again, regardless of therapeutic area. And so we are seeing a push on the part of, of pharmaceutical companies and specialty organizations to really try and get attached to community clinic, community points of, of care. And what that means is that you're tapping into physicians who are not accustomed to research. They want to be part of research, but they don't have the practices, they don't have the staff to support it. And um, even then getting, you know, there's also in the chat, a little stream of yes, so much valuable healthcare information exists outside of a point of care. And getting access to that also means that you're skewing richer, wider, it's, uh, and and so it's really that I think you know there's one challenge in getting to the community physicians. Um, there's another challenge in getting at the data that is happening outside of outside of a care setting uh, and just part of day day activities of daily living. Um, that is really important and and I, you know again I think we're probably five to ten years from really having good validated ways of collecting that data. I hope it's faster, but I think that the reality of that term validated uh, means that we're it's it, we're, it's a medium term thing, not a near term thing. I think this is an important thread to talk about, which is, you know, the notion of social determinants of health. I think, Mary, you had that really interesting uh, comment earlier about transportation. And I know in some of our earlier conversations that we had leading up to today, you know, you talked to me a little bit about banking um, and financial records, and you've talked to me a little bit also about kind of the role of that Secretary of State and the driver's license and what this means for older adults is to kind of, um, I'll say, outside the healthcare point of data that still have incredible relevancy. And I'd, I'd love for you to just maybe talk about a few of those things. Yeah, I have a really great example. So I uh, am renewing my license. And so I'm going to be 75. And a lot of my friends are doing the same. And so they all have to take and prepare for the driver's test. And so I took the ARP driver's class and I had found, my husband found for me a really good program with AI built into it. So it doesn't just teach you the rules of the road, it helps you understand the rules of the road. So in this class I was in, which was live, I said, um, oh, this program will really help you understand this, the signs and everything. Well, people said, I don't have a computer. So when you realize that digital access to your point about data sets 
is not there for everyone. So the notion of just with what COVID taught us is we first have to help people get digitally literate. And then that's another way to, to gather information. Otherwise, you could just have someone check the box and say, unfit to drive, you know? And so I think that's a big uh, place that you see it. Banking is another. So older people are looking for things to do. And so they want to go and talk to the banker, the savings and loan person. They don't want the automated, uh, necessarily want the automated um, ATM because it's part of their socialization. And so the it's the book clubs, it's the pharmacies, it's these local places where older adults appear that that's where you begin to see that they might just be losing it. So when their boyfriend friend tells them to withdraw some of the money, someone they met you know, then then the banker now sees that maybe something's not okay with mom or dad. So it's it's looking at maybe some of these unconventional sources of data um, or and not just data, but, you know, potentially, you know, thinking about this a little bit more humanistically um, contact points that we have in our community. But, you know, for a lot of those contacts, there is kind of a record. There's something that exists out there. Right. Um, you I, know, I think the Surgeon General's report is really important about loneliness and even the fewer hours that families are connected, fewer places that people can go and gather. And as they get into their 80s, they have often fewer friends, you know, because they lose their friends. They lose some of their friends. So we have to think locally and we have to think very broadly about how do we reach these caregivers and how do we train the caregivers many of whom do not understand the nuances of the research reports on things like dementia but they're in the front lines day to day um, i think it's a really interesting point maybe ryan I'll, I'll ask you you know we've talked about some of these um kind of unstructured data things, things like that we see, for instance, like notes in a health record or maybe uh, a banking flag or things like that. How how do you, as someone who's looking at data sets, start to consider some of this unstructured data that's out there to help um, weave a more rich and thorough story about the populations that we're trying to analyze? Sure. Um, so first of all, I guess I should acknowledge that I'm not really an expert on analyzing unstructured data. I certainly collaborate with those that do. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an exciting time to be in that area of research. You know, there's been, there have been over the last five, six, 10 years, pretty incredible advances in uh, natural language programming, the use of large language models, uh, deep learning methods in general to work directly with unstructured data uh, to analyze that type of data. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to keep an eye on these emerging methodologies. Um, it's, it's hard to keep track of, right? Because there's, there's so many people working in this domain. It's hard to decide, uh, you know, what is the most valuable research to focus on. And, and part of that is that from a machine learning data analysis perspective, uh, there, there aren't really established rigorous benchmarking approaches. Um, every problem is different. It's, it's, it's challenging to say, well, this method works better than this method for these reasons. Um, it actually turns out to be a whole can of worms. Um, and so there is a, currently a little bit of faith in saying, I'm going to use this method and run with it. Uh, but in general, trying to understand the advantages and disadvantages to any given approach, typically with these new, you know, uh, these new methodologies that, that rely on deep learning, the biggest trade-off for me um, is that you know you're most of the time giving up interpretability, which in medicine is often a, a huge selling point for methodology. We want to be able to trust our models and understand the the predictions uh, that are being made by them, um, and that's always been a big disadvantage of deep learning, despite you know the hype and the the attention that deep learning has has uh, you know received. Not to say anything, you know, deep learning is also incredible. It does some pretty amazing stuff, but it's just one tool in the toolkit, right? There, we got to remember to use the right tool for the right job. And often that's not going to be deep learning for some of those reasons that I just mentioned. 
You know, with that, maybe Elizabeth, you're sort of in the in the throes of where the rubber meets the road between these things, which is maybe traditional and conventional data sets, and then the understanding that they're not capturing necessarily the full picture. How do you how do you bridge that chasm, and what are some of those things that you think about day to day? Well, um, one is. Let's start with, with counts, patient counts. Like how many, to answer a certain question with a cert, with the required degree of rigor for the purpose, how many patients do you need in your analysis? And how are you gonna get there? Um, with On some level you would say, oh, it's Alzheimer's, it should be easy. Um, there are lots of Alzheimer's patients, but actually finding the patients and then someone, someone mentioned federated data, um, in the chat, I would add the, you know, this idea of federated data, uh, to Ryan's list of wishful thinking. Um, it's just not that easy. And because everybody's structured differently, um, similar terms, even among very, you know, the leading experts, or maybe even especially amongst the leading experts, are used somewhat differently and mean somewhat different things depending on who entered the data. Um, how you bring all that together in the end means that actually it can getting sufficient patient numbers can be tough. Um, I think that, um, yeah, we, I don't know, I feel like we've covered a fair amount of this ground, but um, we do think a lot about, are there other, are there big data records that we can go to? So we, we have another study in another, t in another therapeutic area um, where we actually are using driving records um, as an indicator of safety events. Um, I've heard of research around gun ownership and Alzheimer's. As someone said, you know, we now, doesn't take much to get a gun a lot of people are gonna have Alzheimer's and they're gonna have guns. And that is a, when, when someone mentioned this research to me, I was like, oh my God, I'd never thought about that. That's really, really scary. Um, you know, we th so we think about things like that. Uh, someone has mentioned prisons. We, we've been exploring work uh, with prisons. Um, it is very hard. Uh, for a whole range of reasons. Um, but we do try and push ourselves to think about um, how, how big can you get with some degree of reliability, depending on the research purpose. Um, maybe I'll pause there. Well, it's interesting. I, I want to maybe pivot the conversation just a little bit as we kind of, as we're, we're getting towards um, the tail of our conversation here. The, the first thing I guess I, I want to ask a, a little bit about is, you know, uh, you mentioned how many people do I need to have a successful study? What is that? What is that number? And I would ask, you know, because of the very nature of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, which is that it involves a person who is not um, cognitively at normal function and sometimes is depending on other people to help guide them to uh, appointments or create continuity in their day-to-day -day life and structure and medical records. Do you think, is that, is that part of the reason um, that you all think that we have difficulty getting access to this is because of the nature of this disease itself and the necessity for that, um, I'll say, caregiver role in um, its acquisition and, you know, kind of regular study. So I would say that a lot of the challenges in accessing data for Alzheimer's are in many, many therapeutic areas. Um, it's just it's the reason even, you know, real world research is supposed to be more efficient and cheaper than clinical trials. And it isn't always. Um, I 
But I think for all the other societal reasons that we've been talking about, Alzheimer's presents an a special challenge. Alzheimer's, psychiatry, um, you know, dare we even say the word pain, where, you know, you, you begin to, so we begin to ask ourselves, is it that actually there is, that the, the science is nascent because there's a lack of data, or is there a lack of data because the science is really nascent? Because when you, I mean, look, I know there, there's so much research going on in Alzheimer's. I get that. But when you look at the way research has evolved relative to how research has evolved in oncology, rheumatology, you know, inflammation, rheumatology, those sorts of things, um, the science isn't as in, isn't as mature as those disease areas. We don't, we simply don't know as much about the evolution of the disease, the methods of research, the methods of clinical practice as, as we do about these other areas. And I do think that the lack of data, it becomes an iterative thing. Well, I think that's actually really interesting and where we want to kind of end our conversation, which is, talking about insights, right? Because the the hope is that through using data more constructively that we are able to glean some of these insights that help us uh, create better care pathways that empower caregivers to have more meaningful interactions, all kind of, I'll just say all the good things that we, we um, uh, hope for here in healthcare. So let's talk a little bit about that interpretation part of it, you know, like, we're talking about all of these things, these massive data sets, these social determinants of health, lots of points of M uh, for, for data to enter into the picture. How do we make that meaningful? And going back to kind of this patient experience, like what does that maybe maybe look like for this disease state? Um, and I, I know this is ac uh, asking us to be a little bit of that half full uh, kind of perspective, but I think that's a good place to sometimes go. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Mary, you know, thinking about a lot of people, where, where do you think people who are going through some of this would want to see this data that they're participating in their data? How would they make it meaningful? Or what is maybe some of the hope around that? I don't, I don't know if this is the exact answer to that question, but what I see entrepreneurs doing is focusing on the care managers. And the problem with being a caregiver, you know, it's a, an average of 49 year old woman who's already got a full time job and a family. She's very club sandwiched. And so to add anything else into that role is hard. And a lot of the caregiving is done by the family. But recently I've been seeing a kind of new category and companies like the key, I think, do a really good job of finding great caregivers and educating them about dementia. So I think you have to look at the corporate role of who is playing a role in the caregiving economy. In fact, that's, you know, we're having a conference on that in December. Um, and I also think AI can play a role. So those are that I think AI can play a role in the training. So I think that we have to look at the people who are touching the patient not the patient themselves, to build data sets around the caregiver economy, because that's the one that's going to be on the front lines pointing to this person has a problem or this person doesn't have a problem. There still will be a need to have research with the end user. And groups like Cabby and the group in the UK, they're beginning to create panels where you can aggregate and find some of those data samples. Thanks, Mary. I think that's, you know, food for thought. Um, Ryan, when, when you think about kind of that, the synthesis, the so what of it all, what are things that you're thinking about? Sorry, the so, so, the so what of? So, yeah, I mean, we have all, data is wonderful, but if we can't distill it to have a meaningful insight that can 
change either a care pathway or inform how people should be uh, approaching their disease management. It's it's not it's it's just data and numbers. So how do we how do we do that? How do we you know look for those insights? Gotcha. Um, I mean, so first off, uh, I mentioned uh, transparent or interpretable machine learning. That's that's one element that I always sort of fall back to as being important. And uh, like I said, there's a lot of hype around uh, AI technologies that are are very much black boxes. They're they're opaque. Um, and so I'd like to see more research and researchers developing and using methods that are directly interpretable. There's a small subset of us out there, but we're we're largely overwhelmed. Uh, so that's one thing to pay attention to. Um, and, you know, focusing on understanding, you know, what are the variables that are important in our data sets um, and what else we should be collecting. So, you know, when we're collect, well, when we're analyzing data, I feel like one question we should always have in the back of our heads is, if I was to do this study again, you know, in the future, what would I want to collect instead? You know, what would be better variables or a better way to collect the data? Um, and uh, another thing that's important, you know, on the topic of data size and fairness, right? Most people, when they think of data collection, they think more is better. And, you know, uh, you know that is in most cases true, right? We need more data to have more power, to more have more confidence. But with larger data sets, you know, typically they're going to end up, you know, being messier. Um, they're going to be more heterogeneous, which is both good and bad. It's good because we're representing a greater diversity of people, hopefully, if we're, if we're doing a good job gathering a, a broader data set. Um, uh, but it, the, the, and the downside is that a lot of methodologies are not really set up you know, in analyzing data to consider this heterogeneity. And when I mean heterogeneity, I, just, I don't just mean different backgrounds, but I mean heterogeneous associations, where if we're trying to predict an outcome, the factors that contribute to the occurrence of that outcome can be very different for different groups of people. So you know, this, this group of people over here, they get the disease due to these genes. And over here, it's this combination environment and some maybe other gene uh, or, or and beyond. And a lot of methodologies that we have, they're just trying to put together the one best holistic model that's gonna make a decision for everyone. And that's, that's a problem in itself from a methodological perspective. Um, this is an area that we're interested in, we study. Um, and again, I'd like to see more people just take this into consideration and think about, you know, what methodologies uh, could we develop or could we improve to tackle those kinds of problems? Might be a little bit in the weeds, but. Oh, I, you know what, we're, we're all, this, this is all about uh, creating these data insights. So I don't think it's in the weeds at all. And hopefully we have people sitting on the line that are thinking very much in the same way that you are about this. Um, and maybe Elizabeth, I'll I'll give you kind of the the last call on this one, which is you know what are those insights? What's the things that we're hoping to glean? What are some of the things that you'd like to glean as you're thinking about this? So, so when I look at what you know, what one can look at the pharma pipeline for treatment, and it seems to me that there is a shift to earlier and earlier treatment. This is harder and harder. This is hard to do because people don't, diagnosis doesn't always happen early. And um, someone early, I've been monitoring, clearly I've been monitoring the chat all along here, um, but someone mentioned something about, could we do something like what was done during COVID where many people, mm -hmm. uh, Unfortunately, I think not enough, but many people shared their data in some way. And I think that being able to get access to data in a way that allows us to understand what early diagnosis really looks like and begin to develop some more definitive early diagnosis, um, there's a lot to be overcome in that. We've talked about a lot of that here just in the last hour, but um, I would really like to begin to see more rigor around early diagnosis, more concrete understanding of what early disease looks like and, and how, um, and what both patient and provider and payer, you know, systemically, what, what does that need to look like? Because that is not where our system is 
early diagnosis is not where our system is geared to. Um, I, I think see, it's going to be essential for, for good treatment. I, I see I Mary and Ryan nodding <laughs> aggressively. Uh, Go ahead. I just want to say, I really agree with you about the um, identification of a patient population that can participate in that early diagnosis. And I think, I think that's where you're going to get the motivation of the end user to participate. Absolutely. Yeah, I think this is, uh, you know, like an, an, a good example for an opportunity for maybe citizen science, right? How do you get people engaged? How do you, how do you give them uh, incentives to be engaged in either providing data or, or, you know, helping us to understand early detection and at the same time, you know, link that, you know, link that to a direct benefit to them? Well, I, wild idea, which is why not gay, why not? make it fun, you know. So Aegis <laughs> Innovation has partnered with uh, ARP to stimulate new uh, people to play games, as, you know, and um, they launch new games like um, uh, Monopoly and Trivial Pursuit with many generations. But one of the things older people talk about is, you know, using gaming to, uh, keep their brains active, like the crossword puzzle. So if you kind of begin with what they're doing, 150 million people watch Wheel of Fortune. Talk about an audience and a population. And I was at a memorial for a woman who was 102 and the secret was Wheel of Fortune, you know, keeping that brain active in her book club. So I kind of think we need like a, a big initiative to get people to get motivated and to make brain health as important as physical health and cardiac health. Well, I love this. I, I think we've heard everything from citizen scientists to um, extended multi-generational gameplay from Mary and Elizabeth's uh, concerns about keeping the caregiver involved and staying patient-centric. I think ultimately what we've heard is there's lots of opportunity here. Um, so I'm actually going to say at this point, thank you to all of my guests today uh, for your really, um, you know, poignant insights uh, for your experience in your relative fields. I think there's uh, a lot to be done here. We're actually going to now pivot into talking about uh, the brain health innovation challenge that we're currently working on and where the opportunity is for those entrepreneurs that Mary is so excited to have participate in this process, uh, dig into some of these problems. So with that, Ryan, Elizabeth, and Mary, I'm going to say thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. It was Very a pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, Matter, uh, with support from the Lundbeck U.S. Charitable Fund, is really pleased to uh, be putting on the Restoring Brain Health Innovation Challenge. And really, what we're looking to do is accelerate insights in Alzheimer's disease and related dementia through advanced data science. Um, so the the real goal of this is uh, the challenge question statement states is to ask how could data science generate novel insights from disparate sources to advance care in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. As you all just heard from our panel, we recognize that there are many different places that uh, data is coming from and that being able to distill this into meaningful insights is really significant. <clears throat> So um, currently, uh, if you're interested in participating in this program, we opened up applications August 7th. They'll be closing in a little more than uh, two weeks on September 29th. And then we'll be announcing the cohort on October 20th. Following that, there will be a 12-week accelerator program, a great accelerator of uh, both custom uh, curriculum, mentorship, and opportunities to work with people throughout the healthcare industry that are focused on both the use of data and uh, its purposes for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And the final showcase will be at the end of January. 
Um, if you're interested, you may be wondering what some of the submission criteria is. So uh, we're looking for entrepreneurs that are developing a solution that accelerates insights into Alzheimer's disease through advanced data science. This is open to companies all over the world. So please uh, join us. Uh, we're open to teams and individuals throughout the innovation ecosystem. So if you are at a university and you're a researcher, if you're a student with an idea, if you're uh, an early entrepreneur, if you're an existing startups of any stage, we're interested in hearing from you. Um, we're interested in early stage concepts to things that are already on the market. Um, and especially if your solution does not currently have an application for Alzheimer's disease, uh, you can still apply. So if you're coming to us from another industry, uh, we heard about banking, we heard a little bit uh, about some of the social services that you think that there is a connection, uh, we invite you to, to apply. Um, the criteria is pretty straightforward. Uh, we want you to be able to clearly articulate how your solution relates to the challenge statement. Uh, we want to understand the quality, feasibility, and scale of your solution, how it's different from other things that are currently in the marketplace. We want to hear a little bit about yourself and your team, how you would move uh, through executing on the solution. Um, and we also want to understand how it really will um, help uh, generate novel insights from these disparate sources. Some of the benefits of participating in this program is that you'll get to meet other like-minded startups. Uh, you'll be able to network with both those peers and leading influencers, some of which you heard from today. Uh, you'll gain mentorship from industry experts and subject matter experts, including the broad matter community. Uh, we ensure that we have some investors uh, participating in our programs to get insights from them as far as what's happening in the funding sphere, uh, health systems providers and other healthcare ecosystem uh, members. And we're also providing a $10,000 stipend upon completion of the challenge. So if you're participating in the program, uh, we understand time is money and this is part of that. And last, but certainly, certainly not least, is there's a free six-month MATTER membership that will begin at the conclusion of the challenge where we will continue to support your growth and development. So with all of that, uh, just to reiterate, the deadline is Friday, September 29th at 11.59 p.m. If you have questions, you're able to email Casey at matter.health. And you can visit matter.health and go to our challenges page to get more information about the challenge itself. Uh, we'll go ahead and drop that into the chat here. Um, so with that, thank you for joining us today. We're thrilled to have had you um, and we hope that you'll visit us for more information. Have a great day.